reminder to everybody that uh, we are going to record this um, so you know we're going to record it for uh, there were some participants uh, people that were interested in participating that weren't able to do so today so we're going to record uh, the event this morning on zoom and then have that available to people uh, so again, welcome to the New Hampshire Living Shorelines uh, professional network event. Uh, this is a virtual field trip of the Wagon Hill Farm Living Shorelines in Durham, New Hampshire. Um, and what we're going to do today um, is uh, basically on our agenda. I'm going to jump ahead to the agenda here for a second. We have three short clips of a field trip, basically, that we did with the design team of the, of the Wagon Hill uh, living shoreline. So there's three short videos that we're going to show one at a time. Uh, after each section, the first one's an introdu introduction to the site. Then we'll have a Q&A on the introduction. And then we have a short video on site conditions. And then we'll have a short Q&A or a Q&A on the site conditions video. And then we have a site design section of the video. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A on the site design. And then we'll have an open Q&A. And then we are going to, uh, uh, you know, we'll have that open Q&A session and hopefully we'll be, get to all your questions. Again, uh, post your questions in the chat and I'll monitor that and relay those to Tom and Dave. Um, after we get through the Q&A sections and all three videos, we have an opportunity that we're going to talk about a uh, future opportunity to join a Living Shoreline design team. We'll have a uh, closing poll or evaluation and then a few uh, uh, we'll have we have some a uh, little bit of time at the end if we didn't get to your Q&A once we end the official event this morning workshop this morning online we have a few minutes to actually spend online afterwards if you're available to do so it's an optional thing so uh, just I think everybody's pretty much familiar with uh, the Zoom world, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, working on Zoom. Uh, we've got everybody muted because again, there's the number of participants. Um, on the bottom, of course, there's the chat function. The, and uh, again, we're going to use that quite a bit today. Um, and I think once we get to the videos, uh, you know, the view button up in the top right hand corner, there's the speaker view, gallery view, and full screen. You may want to just uh, try some different things once we get to the videos that give you the best viewing of the video. Uh, um, so just uh, monitor that. Um, the speaker view is always nice just to kind of, uh, when, when we're doing the Q&A um, uh, for communications point, but you may need to use the full screen. Uh, to do a good to get the best viewing of the videos when we're showing those. So again, at the end, uh, once we're through all three segments, we'll have a Q&A and then we do have a few extra minutes after the official ending of the workshop. If we didn't get to your questions, if if I miss your question, um, uh, raise your hand to me and then rewrite your question in the chat. It's really hard to scroll back uh, to find those. So. Uh, I apologize ahead if I've missed uh, them. Um, we are going to try to on each section. Uh, so again, the introduction, the first Q&A will be specific to that introduction section. The second Q&A will be specific to site conditions. And the third will be sp specific to the site design. And then we'll have an open Q&A. So uh, definitely maybe write down your questions if it's pertinent to a different section than we're working on at the time and be sure to put that into the chat. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Dave to introduce themselves and uh, introduce the first video. And I think it first goes to Tom. Hi, uh, for those of you who don't know me, Tom Ballestero. I'm at the University of New Hampshire with the Coastal Habitat and Research Team. I'm an engineer by profession and uh, my expertise is kind of in the area of uh, restoration of uh, aquatic systems. That would be streams, wetlands, living shorelines, uh, and uh, similar types of features. Dave? Thanks, Tom. Um, Dave Burdick. I'm director of the Jackson Estuarine Lab at UNH and associate professor of coastal ecology in the Department of Natural Resources. I've been working on salt marshes, seagrasses, and sand dunes for about 30 years. And um, I have a sort of a habitat focus and uh, this uh, living shoreline brings together a lot of interesting issues and concepts 
um, that hopefully we'll del delve into today. Uh, the first video is going to be an introduction to the project. How do you get a project like this going? How does it, what's the genesis? How does it start um, usually, usually from, from the client uh, it's the, themselves? But, but there are a number of different ways for a project to start. And uh, you'll see how the project grew in complexity and the number of partners uh, in this introduction. So... Um, we, we set the project up to uh, be sure there was uh, educational components in this the whole way. And so this is one of the uh, results. Uh, this webinar is one of the results from, from that work that, that uh, has occurred over the last uh, four years. And um, Kristen, uh, Kristen Howard is uh, from DES is gonna start that first video. Okay, very good. Hi, I'm Dave Burdick, and uh, I'm the director of the Jackson Estuarine Lab, and I've been working on coastal ecology and coastal restoration for 30 years. And uh, my colleague uh, is not an ecologist, but an engineer. Hi, Tom Ballestero. Welcome to the COVID edition of Living Shorelines. I'm uh, with the, also with the University of New Hampshire, the coastal habitat research team, along with Dr. Burdick and a number of other profs researchers and uh, I am involved with the engineering and uh, monitoring of living shoreline sites such as Wagon Hill. The property was purchased in the 1990s by the town of Durham and uh, by 2000 it was pretty clear that there was an erosional problem at the site and by 2008 uh, we had several meetings to discuss the issues around the site and by 2016 we actually got down to to work because the technical aspects of living shorelines sort of intersected with this and was a, a sort of encouraged us to make this happen with working with the town and uh, ecologists and engineers coming together and also state agencies looking for ways to uh, enhance uh, shorelines that are being eroded and also that are going to be being changed by concerned property owners who don't want to lose land to erosion. An important facet of this project is uh, uh, public awareness, public education, uh, to understand what was happening, especially at the Wagon Hill site, which uh, has a number of different interest groups involved with the overall Wagon Hill site. Uh, for our project partners, a uh, kiosk like this was um, uh, developed by the Stratford Regional Planning Commission, and uh, we had a lot of other partners. but. Uh, this kiosk basically goes through the timeline of uh, the project from when the property was purchased until when we did actually did the construction, goes through the finances and the funding, and then as Dave was mentioning, some of the issues that were happening at this site. So um, taking a big broad brush look at the issue uh, over the eastern seaboard of the United States. Most of the salt marshes are under threat from various issues, and there are some estimates that we'll be losing the majority of them by the end of the century. And uh, if we can do anything to preserve or increase them now, that'll only uh, help us in the, in the long run. I wanted to zoom in for a second to show the original shoreline right here. And if you can't see this, uh, you'll see an image right afterwards. But I wanted to point out an old peat um, block with some live plants and some non-live plants, and then a large erosional area to the rear of that with actually a tree trunk surrounded by sand. And the town had put a fence up um, about 22 years ago, I think. And then uh, that got eroded out and fell in. And then they put rocks uh, under, uh, on top of geotextile and moved the fence back um, about 20 feet. And then that was starting to fall in. And so that was about um, 2016. So that really precipitated this whole project. So you can see the erosional area. Tom measured the erosion at this site as about a half a foot a year, but it must have been worse than that some years to get that, that rate that we actually, the overall rate Absolutely. over the two decades. Absolutely. So we'll show you some erosion pins and how we measure erosion uh, a little later on. 
but uh, just the movement of the fence was on the order of a rate of about a foot a year. Um, the average that Dave, Dave just reported is the average erosion rate along this south facing portion of the system and locally where we had erosion pins we were seeing rates of some up as high as a foot per year. So the erosive attack hasn't really stopped. There are a lot of culprits that we could point to. Um, ice, there was a lot of foot traffic, humans and animals on the marsh. Um, the trees that had been far away from the marsh a century ago now were uh, very large trees right over the marsh, shading, the, shading out the marsh. Uh, sea level rise, uh, boat traffic and waves, and almost every tidal cycle when the tide goes out you can see uh, sediment and erosion happening on the banks. So uh, there was a very severe erosion happening here and what ultimately happens is the salt marsh was being eroded back leaving in front of it mud flats. And that erosive face was a vertical face on the order of a half a foot to three foot high. And any vertical face in a hydraulic environment like this is an aggressive point of attack. And therefore, um, this has to be considered when you're actually coming up with the design. How are you going to do the edge protection? Um, what's very, very novel about this particular site is we built out to the shoreline that we estimated we had about 30 years ago. And normally, uh, this uh, mud flat area that we built out into would be jurisdiction of either the state or the federal government. So it actually took uh, over th uh, three dozen meetings and discussions with the citizens, with the town, with uh, the design group, and with all the regulators. It was important to have everybody involved in that room to be able to move this project forward. Okay. Well, uh, I hope everybody was able to see and hear that well enough. I didn't, nobody mentioned any technical difficulties, which is good. Um, and we are gonna uh, start uh, with a Q and A section on this introduction. Um, we have a few slides. You wanna do the slides now? Did I miss this? Oh, Tom, you're on mute, sorry. You're right. There we go. I just wanted the audience to uh, get an idea of um, what the site looked like before um, we actually did the restoration. So uh, in this slide, the, the marsh in the background is actually what we considered more or less a, re a reference marsh, which is always nice to have nearby. This was the stump Dave had pointed out. And I had made the comment that every tidal cycle as the tide was going out, you could mm -hmm. see erosion. And here in this picture, clearly in August of 2016, you can see the waves of sediment moving out. And again, this shoreline we built out about 30 feet. Um, this was the shoreline in 1992 from a Google Earth image. And this was the shoreline in 2015. And the difference between the two, you can see how the erosion occurred here. The erosion um, obviously is arrested where we have this pier that goes back a, a century or more. There's a lot of riprap here, but as you move around the Wagon Hill site, there's still more erosion. And uh, we'll show you the erosion pins later, but uh, we can certainly attest to a very aggressive erosion almost everywhere along this bank um, and further to the uh, west and uh, north. And then again, where the blue pins are, that's more or less our um, reference site. Okay, excellent. Uh, so a uh, reminder to everybody to use the chat to relay your questions, uh, questions about the introduction section. Uh, those slides were very helpful, especially the one with the tree trunk I found interesting because you'll see that later when we get into the design and also to see the uh, erosion on the tidal cycle to see the mud actually along the shore of the darker water. So uh, again, uh, uh, questions from the participants, uh, just type them in there into the chat. I'm not seeing anything come up. So uh, I want to just, if I can, jump in, try to monitor that. Um, so I, one of the points in the, the introduction video is 
Tom, you mentioned about the number of meetings that it took with all the different stakeholders. Um, you might, if you could just add a little bit to that, uh, I think that's a really important point when we talk about living shorelines and getting projects started. Right, uh, so very close to uh, any water uh, body, um, the public and uh, the landowners have a very uh, intimate relationship with that water body, often perceiving it to be their very own. And so uh, with uh, restoration projects, it's important to get every stakeholder, any person that may have a concern or input into the process early on. Um, and again, there were about three dozen meetings with this uh, property because there are so many different uses. And um, recognizing that uh, people and dogs were walking all over this site, um, obviously people do like to enjoy the water. So it was important to have some location where people could access as well as uh, protecting that location mm -hmm. from being loved to death. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point about having access to water. Uh, uh, I think that's just human nature. Uh, Tom, there's a question, Tom and Dave, there's a question here about uh, where, um, do you know where the eroded sediment goes in the estuary? I can opine on that. Um, with those uh, sediments, they're very fine. So clay sized, maybe upwards of silt size, which means they don't deposit or settle out very easily. So the mud flats would be the first place they would want to deposit, but they could go all the way out to the ocean because uh, again, they're clay sized sediments. Okay, very good. There's also a question here about how did you mitigate the permitting? And uh, Jennifer, maybe you can help me with uh, if there's something more specific you mean by mitigate. But Tom, how did Tom and Dave, how did you mitigate the permitting? Um, go ahead, Dave. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, it it was difficult to to do in some respects. We are creating a living shoreline, so we were going out over the original mud flat. Um, and so that was because we showed that that was originally salt marsh that was um, sort of granted, but we did have to take down a number of trees along the edge. And those trees that where the trees were is an area where as sea level rises, marsh can migrate back. So pro by providing marsh migration space, and planting trees well out of the way of the rising tides, um, we satisfied the, the permitters. So we did. So we didn't have to do any specific mitigation for the project. Um, uh, Jennifer gave uh, some more information here about the question. Uh, she says, "How do you mitigate the permitting between the people and the agencies?" And I guess I I, I would interpret that. I think. Uh, uh, I think was mentioned again when you guys were in front of the, the sign there and she says the public. Um, and I guess it just refers to the importance of the public education component and the communication component. And how was that dealt with in this project? Well, I think everyone understands erosion and everyone's seen erosion and, and everyone recognizes that this is a very uh, valuable piece of land for the town. And it's where the townspeople really interact with the, the river, the Oyster River, more so than any other location. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're, they're happy to support an erosion control project. And then the education part was, yes, we think we can do this with live plants and as well as structural components as a combination rather than just a seawall. I, I might also interject that um, historically, when you go across the country, there's no distinction in the regulatory uh, uh, codes between building a dock and doing a restoration. And this is not necessarily just li uh, living shorelines, so even in the stream restor restoration and wetlands. And some states like New Hampshire have actually revised their wetlands rules to make this clear distinction. Um, the devil's always in the details. That is putting a bush in a rock wall uh, most people may not call um, a living shoreline. So, um, you know, uh, that's one reason why bringing in the regulators as well as all the other stakeholders in to kick around uh, all the options and uh, what obviously would pass muster and be uh, resulting in a successful permit. 
So believe it or not, we had about half a dozen to a dozen different options we started with. And when we kicked them all around, uh, which again took over a year or two, uh, we finally honed in uh, in, in a system that everybody uh, felt would meet the characteristics of not only what a living shoreline should be, but would also recognize that we're doing a trade-off in ecosystems from mudflat to salt marsh. So any restoration product project is always a trade-off. Okay, very good. Um, just again, reminder everybody, uh, you can put your questions in the chat and I'll relay those to Tom and Dave. Um, we have another we have another minute or two for this section, Tom and Dave. Is there anything else you want to add in terms of the introduction to the site? Well, I, I think a real challenge is avoiding mismatches in project size and client uh, ability and commitment. And I think that's what most contractors and consultants are going to face in the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, so uh, we're very lucky that we worked with a town and we had a lot of help from state agencies, but other people aren't going to find it so easily. Uh, so that's you know one of the challenges I think that the private private groups will face. Okay, very good. There's a question came in about um, has there been an overall positive response or uh, from the public and regulators now that they've seen the results firsthand, and uh, maybe this really gets to. Uh, uh, maybe we can provide a little more information about how the site's going to be used. Yeah, I, I personally have seen a dramatic um, uh, reception by the public. I think um, most people that I chat with whenever I'm out there um, were fully supportive. And actually, uh, uh, it's been a dramatic improvement. And um, some of the positive responses aren't things that you can actually put a, a value on. Uh, for example, more people taking pictures there, more people targeting specifically to go by here and the observation deck, just to look out at the bay and look out at the marsh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, do you think that the permitting process has become uh, less vigorous with uh, more living shoreline projects landing on, on their desk, meaning uh, the desk of permitters? Um, I'm not a regulator, but um, I, I think they're viewed much more positively than using gray infrastructure. So when I say gray infrastructure, hardening our shorelines is not really creating habitat. And, and the real niche for living shorelines is they're not only providing uh, protection to infrastructure, or in this case, stopping erosion, but they're all also providing similar habitat that is either nearby them or was uh, uh, destroyed by the process, in this case of erosion. So mm -hmm. I think regulators in generally favor the greener solutions to the grayer solutions, but you have to recognize that each site is so specific. Um, there, you, you can't always put a living shoreline at every site. However, there are many sites where that is an appropriate solution. Okay, very good. Okay, we're doing great on the agenda and it's a perfect time for us to transit to the uh, second video. This video is really about the site conditions, very specific conditions to the site. And so with that, we'll start the second video. One of the uh, significant causes of erosion on any of these shorelines and particularly this one is where the runoff from upland areas comes onto either the buffer area or the upper marsh or the lower marsh. As the water travels longer and longer flow paths, it starts to concentrate and collects and then it starts to gully. And especially on soft marsh sediments, those gullies can be dramatically uh, deep and wide. And so what we did was we tried to do some regrading of the upland area in order to take runoff that normally would have run onto this marsh and move it laterally and put it into a stormwater green infrastructure system. So this uh, fire retention system that was designed uh, was a typical design. It's sized. Uh, most people don't even know it's there. It can be mowed. It's very easy to maintain. And it was designed to not only accommodate the runoff, but how it works is the water filters through very permeable media, collects at the bottom, where it can either infiltrate or if the system fills up, it would just uh, flow as it normally would right into the bay. 
We also tried to design in this system what we call uh, wet feet, or we have basically a saturated layer of stone at the bottom, then what happens there is denitrification. So the Great Bay is impaired for nitrogen from all the various sources, and so anywhere we can actually start to remove nitrogen, it's just beneficial for the bay. You can see here, the typical erosion pattern you see in these marshes is that the marsh gets undercut. Once it gets undercut, then it's overhanging. The overhanging piece starts to slowly subside, as you're seeing uh, over in the foreground here. Once it subsides, again, the vegetation is no longer viable, and then it starts to erode, or chunks of it will come off, and in the winter, these can actually wrap out with ice, and so now and then you'll see chunks of these out in the mud flats after the winter. So uh, what we typically do to monitor the erosion is we'll drive in horizontal pieces of rebar two feet or three feet long. We'll put them in flush with the marsh and then after a few weeks, months or years, we'll come out and read how much is exposed. That is, would then give you the erosion rate, the amount of exposure divided by the time that you had in between readings. Just wanted to show you uh, an erosion pin and so here you can barely see the tip of the rebar sticking out. So this one was last checked or reset probably about eight months ago, six months ago, uh, probably around January or December. And it's only sticking out maybe an inch. So six months is a half a year. So that would be an erosion rate of two inches per year. What typically happens as we've identified before is the bank gets undercut. And as you look eastward, you can see, again, this process where it gets undercut, it accelerates, the marsh starts to collapse, and ultimately the uh, entire pieces of marsh just fall down to a lower elevation, and this is all washed away. And again, if you look at this, this scarp is on the order of three feet high. And if you're trying to protect the marsh, your options are, for example, come out with a gradual slope. And if you did that, you might have to have that slope go out 100 feet or more into the mudflat in order to have a gradual enough slope such that you don't get aggressive erosional attack on that vertical face. The other option is some type of armor, whether it be core logs with vegetation or a sill. But again, your biggest Achilles heel or your biggest uh, challenge is you can't grow anything that's really going to do erosion protection with roots below the elevation of mean sea level, which is about right here. So that's, again, why you need some type of reinforced sill in, in the leading edge. On the remaining portions of Wagonel Farm, instead of building out 20, 30 feet like we did before, we're only talking about building out a little, if any, putting in some type of um, uh, structure that will hold the line on the erosion. But again, we have to start to create a better environment for the marsh grass, one, to be able to grow, so getting rid of shade, preventing uh, foot traffic on it, but also the opportunity for the marsh to migrate landward. Okay, another uh, important potential uh, cause of erosion is shade. So on top of uh, overuse by people, just um, trampling of, of feet and paws, especially paws, because they have those sharp claws, they do cause a lot of erosion. Uh, we wanted to consider shade because there was a lot of lot, there was four or five large shade trees that were being undercut, and their limbs were extending way over the marsh. And uh, most people don't consider shade, but I want to show you this. This is uh, one of the impacts of this, uh, the shade from this oak tree, and you can see there's very few plants that can survive under it, and that's because these plants are, these plants out here these these uh, perennial halophytes these perennial plants perennial grasses that have adapted to living in salt marshes and they're perennial so they come back year after year, they can't survive here because they can't uh, produce enough carbon resources to uh, have all their adaptations and survive the winter. So you can see this little dieback zone. And so we had dieback zones much larger than this around the corner where the trees were shading the marsh. So here we have another section of shoreline which is comparable to the area that was eroding that we protected. And we can see all the blocks of peat in front here that have been falling off the top. Uh, you saw from uh, the shot all the paw prints and the foot traffic and the shade 
from these oak trees is just preventing these plants from holding this peat together. The plants die, the peat falls apart from the actual activity of walking, but then in the winter it will also fall apart because ice will tear it apart too. You're on mute, Steve. I am sorry about that. Uh, very good, thank you. Um, just a quick reminder to let you know to put the uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we've already got a question in there, uh, Tom and Dave, uh, from a, uh, Debbie says she frequently walks at Wagon Hill and the conversation has been positive and uh, it's interesting in what's going on and being done in the future there. Uh, wonderful lesson. Uh, just an appreciation, I guess, of the site. And I think that just uh, also refers to or just reinforces the value and need for that public education component in the big kiosk that was done there. I just want to point that out as well. A lot of good information in that kiosk for that public interface to understand what's happening at the site because a lot of people do use it. So any questions about the uh, site conditions, uh, put them into the chat for us. And I'll start off a little bit here just to get us going. Um, I guess uh, to me, the interest was about the, when are you comfortable with the actual causes of uh, the issues that you're trying to resolve at a, in, in a uh, living shoreline restoration site? I know a lot of work was done at this site to really understand what was causing the erosion or contributing to the erosion. Um. A lot of times taking data and, and deciphering causal factors is uh, akin to the seven people, uh, blind people each touching the elephant. So each uh -huh. piece of information that comes in by itself uh, may point towards one cause. Um, and then altogether, there are cumulative factors. So uh, just like uh, allergies, individually, uh, one source may not uh, make you start sneezing, but uh, ultimately when you have everything being thrown at you at the same time, you just uh, uh, can't resist. And so at the Wagon Hill Farm site, uh, we had so many causative factors. Um, a lot of them were kind of obvious, um, but the process of bank erosion, uh, again, whether it's in a stream or along the shorelines, it is hydraulically pretty consistent. And um, in this case, typically the, uh, the hydraulic attack is usually greatest at the base of a vertical face. And that's what you see here. Um, but uh, just as important to uh, halting erosion and, and what you commonly think of, you know, the first thing people think of to stop erosion is to put in armor something bigger that can't be washed away. And, and yes, that is one way to do it, increase the structural strength. But another way to do it is with the roots of plants. And uh, so when you look at the surface, and, and I think this is what uh, Dave was clearly pointing out, um, if the plants can't survive, then the roots don't survive. And that only aggravates the attack and the erosive process. Okay, very good. And there's a question here about, um, and it's one that I shared in the past when we were at another site looking and talking about the trees and shade, but the question comment is, how close should trees be to the shoreline? And of course, that's a interesting question. I think the trees can be close to the shoreline, but you do have to, um, you have to steward this. So in a perfect world where there's no people, well, maybe that's not a perfect world. How, how should I repeat that? <laughs> in, in a world with, without people and, uh, and a lot of different activities going on, uh, the, the salt marsh would not have been destroyed in many areas that are, you know, that are you know, landfills and such like that, or sewage treatment plants. And those would be salt marshes, but we've, we've lost those because we've, we've done that. So, the, in, a, in a world without management, there would be trees growing to the shoreline. We'd lose the marshes along the edge, but we probably wouldn't have the erosion rates we see here. So when you add people into the mix, the, we have to learn how to do things a little more effectively. And one of the things that we need to do, think about with the trees is overhanging branches. Yes, the tree branches would love to overhang the salt marsh, but um, 
you know, the trees do things for trees, not realizing that uh, they're going to undermine themselves and fall into the water. And we have lots of photographs of those trees in, in the water fall, falling into the water. Uh, so it's really up to people to take the overhanging branches off. And it's just a, it's a management sort of issue. Yeah, and it's an interesting question. Again, when we were at another site last year and we were talking about removing trees, I found my gut kind of uh, curling into a little bit of a knot because it was a like, wait, we we're supposed to be keeping the trees, but it, it is an interesting thing to be thinking about in terms of the stewardship and uh, I guess priorities and then uh, understanding all the issues and making choices and management choices as to what you're going to do on a particular site. And that may require some tree pruning or tree removal, um, which of course is, is going to be upsetting to some people because they, they, they don't understand the connection. And again, that just reinforces the need for the public education um, for, for a successful uh, shoreline restoration. Another question's come in here about uh, sediment uh, uh, eroding off of the site and uh, translating to accretion at another point along the shoreline or suspension. We talked a little bit about this. Um, or is it being lost to the system? Um, and I guess maybe if you could talk to that a little bit, it's more of like a question about the natural processes out there and, and uh, whether that eroded, eroded sediment is positive or negative. Yeah, just a couple words for me, then I wanna turn it over to Tom because I'm sure he has some deeper fundamental truths on this. And, and just anecdotally, I don't see that sediment being um, cannibalized to then feed the rest of this marsh very well. I'm sure a little bit gets on there, but I think most goes into this uh, riverine tidal high current system and uh, you know, just gets diluted. Um, I would agree with that. And um, uh, Dave can probably respond to this better than I, but uh, marsh surfaces need to grow vertically every year. And uh, you know the, the challenge of sea level rise is that it's growing at a rate faster than what the marsh normally grows at. Uh, and so it would be nice if some of these sediments would be trapped by the vegetation and help the marsh grow. But because it's so fine, as you saw in the one slide I showed, it seems to be washed out into the bay. Um, we don't see, or I don't see very large depositional features that, for example, the mud grass, the mud flat is growing higher than the elevation of uh, mean tide and and uh, salt marsh grass is starting to colonize and stabilize those. So uh, I would concur with Dave that these are probably ulti ultimately staying below the mean water line and ultimately moving out to the ocean because they're so fine. Yes, and I, I think I'll just add that I think it reinforces earlier discussion about uh, not all sites, Tom, you mentioned not all sites are uh, suitable for a living shoreline or the conditions are different or all sites, the conditions there will dictate what type of living shoreline or gray green infrastructure you can uh, include. So it's not a one size fits all and important to understand the issues. But of course, we've talked a lot about in terms of salt marshes uh, needing that sediment to build the marshes up. And so I think that's a really good question about what happens to that sediment and understanding all those dynamics. Um, we have a couple minutes here. Uh, could I, could I uh, make yes. a couple points? Peat, the development of peat, when we create new marshes, so like we're trying to create a new section of marsh that was eroded away and lost. We're trying to create new marsh here. And so our that, that the development of that peat may take 20 or 30 years. It's a very slow process. So it takes a long time for the peat to erode. You can see it's the last part that erodes. It erodes under the peat, but the peat's pretty resistant and it erodes slowly, but it, it forms even more slowly. So it's, it is a challenge. Uh, it makes it uh, working on these shorelines a bit of a challenge. And that's why we need these uh, erosion resistant sills. And so we'll be talking about those in the next section. And I think that's a perfect segue. Uh, we have a, a introduction here to the next section. Turn that over to Tom for the few slides. Right. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again and pull up uh, not that, but a different PowerPoint. And uh, on this PowerPoint, uh, again, there, there are formal definitions of what a living shoreline is. I pulled two, one from NOAA and one from the Corps of Engineers. Um, uh, interestingly, 
a living shoreline de by definition does not necessarily have to have plants, but basically you're looking at uh, meeting um, not only infrastructure needs if infrastructure is nearby, but also ecosystem uh, needs or uh, habitat characteristics. Uh, so uh, Steve was kind of alluding to this uh, comment again, living shorelines are not suitable everywhere. And this is a NOAA document uh, that was developed a few years ago. And there is a spectrum from green to gray. And if you look at this, what we did at Wagon Hill is kind of right in the middle. We needed a sill because we had such a high erosion scarp. It was hard to make a very flat slope without impacting hundreds of feet of mudflat. And so we're kind of somewhere in the middle here. And again, at each of your sites, you need to determine what might survive the best. And then lastly, um, these are the types of issues that we were trying to address and how we collected data at this site in order to help us assess ultimately what would survive and how best after we created the site to ensure its integrity. So uh, the sill was there to make sure that we would not uh, lose the, the whole um, uh, fill area, the site into the ocean. So if you think about it, we put in very sandy material that can liquefy easily because it's submerged twice a day. The last thing we wanted was a landslide that would go into the mudflats. So that sill is not only there to protect against wave attack, but also to protect about, you know, basically a slope failure. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, stop sharing. I, I can't tell if I stop share. There it is. I lost that. Thank you. Getting into some of the elements of design, as mentioned earlier, the vertical face of the salt marsh is an intense location of attack. And to counteract that, we have to design around what we believe or what we understand to be the forcing mechanisms. So we've mentioned before ice, we've mentioned the tide, we've mentioned foot traffic. Um, we've prevented the foot traffic by putting the fence around the site. Ice, there's not much we can do. Um, we put pressure transducers out into the bay we measured for long periods of time, not only the tide so that we could get the elevations correct for mean high, high water, mean high water, mean tide, etc. But we were also putting pressure transducers out there in order to understand the wave climate. One excellent design guide we had was the fact that at the end of this sill is a pier that's been there for over a century, a rock pier that the gondolas would use to load and offload product. And so we knew the size of the rock that was there was very stable. And so basically the design exercise was using various design methods to size this rock or whatever we needed to protect this leading edge and then ultimately compare it to what was there. Behind it is not a geotextile. I don't really like putting plastic into the environment. So what we typically use are core products, um, uh, coconut fiber products with uh, very small openings that would hold back the fine materials of the sediment that we place behind it. And then uh, that core product ultimately breaks down in time and ultimately what would be created behind this is a graded filter. In the future, what we typically see right after you build the site is when you're going to have about the sparsest vegetation, especially if you're planting sets. Um, you have this bare surface that water is running across every time the tide comes in and out. And even that's a relatively slow movement of water, it generates velocities high enough that can go in. So I think in the future what we would do is bring the core material from behind the rock up to at least the leading maybe 10 feet or more of the marsh to avoid that type of erosion on the surface. And again, as you'll see in the close-up, the vegetation just grows right up through it. And so green infrastructure compared to gray infrastructure, uh, gray infrastructure is the best. It's perfect the day you build it. Whereas green infrastructure, it's the weakest 
once you've built it, and over time it stabilizes because you're expecting vegetation to take over for you. One of the aspects of the Wagon Hill project that we've adopted from stream restoration practices is including what are called root blinds. In this case, you have basically the bottom 15 feet to 20 feet of a tree without the limbs put into the backfill material and then we built the sill around them. Before we backfilled over these, we used cable ties with duckbill anchors and uh, stainless steel cable to uh, hold them down because uh, the wood ultimately would float, so we want to hold it down. And then the sediment over the top of it also holds it down. But uh, one of the uh, issues with the root lot is that one, it's a natural material, it's wood, but it's got a lot of topography, micro topography. And typically, uh, as we use in stream restoration, uh, the more variability you have of uh, the hydraulic environment, velocity, water depth, turbulence, um, typically the more diversity you get in the aquatic species that are going to be there. And that would be both flora and fauna. The planting design for this system is based on what you see here. This is really what was here initially. So we want to uh, mimic what uh, the plants and the site have sort of produced on them on their own and we're obviously making this better and harder and we're going to change things but we wanted to mimic the different types of plants and how the plants changed as we went from lowest elevation to highest elevation you can see here we have long-lived brown algae that's healthy in the system and um, it's growing on scattered rocks so we have placed it on some of these rocks to have us the first line of defense is waves come and the algae's floating, they can hit the algae and, and start breaking up some, uh, some of that wave force and hopefully we'll get more algae in the future. Here we can see peat. This is the exposed peat from the original peat um, at the site, the, the remnant marsh. And this remnant marsh is planted with Spartina alternaflora, low marsh plant. That's typically the only plant that really survives and it's because it's a perennial grass, it comes back year after year. So these plants, um, these taller plants were planted by hand. You can see some of the lower plants just behind them um, were or already existing. So just uh, 15 feet in from the shoreline, that those plants just came back. But they're growing in peat, and so uh, all these plants are, aren't growing quite as tall as they might expect. Right about here, we have a line uh, between low marsh and high marsh. And so this is the point at which other species can start surviving well. Uh, at this point, we put a core, a core log, and so this is a core log here, which protects the side of this existing transition to, to high marsh and upland. And we've drawn it around and put it between the low marsh and high marsh, just as a, as a demarcation. And it was really valuable and useful because you can walk on this core log without damaging the marsh. So it was kind of a handy thing to have in our system. Above here, we have Spartina patens and uh, a variety of other plant species, Juncus gerardii, Disticulus, and then a little higher up, we have the upper edge of the marsh, which is Spartina pectinata, or slough grass. Again, this was here, and so we planted some pectinata a little farther down as well. Above the pectinata, we have um, a variety of different shrubs. We have some goldenrods, some primrose, and some plants uh, that were, were planted as, as ornamentals. This site, the client wanted uh, turf. He, they wanted the marsh to look like a full-fledged marsh the very first year or at worst the second year we put it in and so uh, a turf was developed and planted by Pearson Nurseries where eight Spartina plants, uh, alternaflora low marsh plants were planted and overwintered and eight Spartina patens plants were planted and overwintered uh, in one flat and then those flats were brought and the whole flat was placed on the surface of the marsh because of some weather issues uh, in the spring and surprise flooding for our grower, uh, most of this Spartina alternaflora did not survive. We ended up doing a lot of hand planting. So we, we worked with a, with a supplier and he supplied us with new plants. Uh, we also bought, purchased some new plants a little early in the season to make sure that they were in. We really like to plant plants in May 
Uh, and that's what the first set was done, but we finally finished the planting in July, which was really late. And it's hard for the plants to be in that heat and to be able to put those new roots down and survive. But they seem to have worked really well. Um, you might notice the rocks here and there. That's to break up any potential ice impacts. And it's also a landing spot for um, birds of prey or other birds that might want to have uh, a little spot. Uh, the Spartina patens, which is the all white, it looks all dead. It's not all dead, but there is a lot of dead. So we see live plants growing in here. It took off so well uh, the first season that it may have uh, dried out the soil too much in the winter and actually uh, uh, had a, a drought issue during the winter when the ground was frozen. I'm not sure why it died. That's my best guess. Uh, we also planted uh, by hand uh, sprigs of Disticlus and Juncus. And so I wanted to show everyone the Disticlus is right in front of me here. Let's, one step, this is Disticlus spicata. You can see how much it's spread. Just that's one growing season. It's amazing. Uh, we also planted Juncus gerardii. And so here's two plants of Juncus gerardii. These original plants were already here. So again, we're just mimicking what was here. We see the um, Spartina pectinata, the, the, uh, the rough cord grass. So we're gonna go onto our mark. So a little farther along the marsh, we see uh, Panicum brigatum and rough cord grass at this upper edge. And then we move into different shrubberies. We have uh, sweet pepper bush, we have um, bayberry, uh, high bush blueberry, um, some dogwood, and some viburnum, and a couple other species up here. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, first let's, uh, uh, we'll have a Q and A about the site design specifically. And then once we have some time with that, we can open it up to all questions about uh, any aspects of the living shoreline design. And there was some interesting questions uh, already in the chat. Um, and uh, one was about if we experimented with stone size in the uh, uh, sill structure. And I think Tom, you mentioned that and just reinforce it was in the video about the uh, launch site there and maybe just reinforce that for a second. Yes, and so uh, big uh, backstory is um, Durham had this rock uh, from uh, excavations all over town that they had stockpiled at one of their uh, pits. And um, when we did the analyses, a smaller rock would have been fine. Um, the rock at the pier is a little bit larger. And when we uh, went through all the different uh, various design methods for rock size, what Durham had was larger. And so we just used that. As far as experimenting with rock size, um, rock sizes on the order of two to four inches could possibly be stable in this environment. And when we start to look at restorations westward of here of the remaining shoreline, that's where we were gonna, uh, again, develop some of these options again, going through meetings with regulators and the town to see what everybody would be happy with. Um, we, were, we were going to look at sills made of smaller sized rocks, sills made of logs, and sills made of uh, composite types of materials. Okay, very good. Uh, lots of questions coming in. I'm gonna try to uh, keep up with them. Um, can you speak to the elevation specific to each of the Spartinas and where they flourish and where they are challenged? And then maybe talk about some of the resources we have coming up. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by resources, Steve, but um, every site uh, can be a little different. We could give you uh, probably NAVD 88s for this site, but I think the best way to, to explain it for everyone to get the most out of this is about from the um, from the mid from the mid tide line, or a little higher than the mid tide line, but very close to that, to mean high water, we have the low marsh, which is dominated by Spartina altiniflora. There's very few other plants that can survive there. Um, there's no other the 
of the grassy perennials that will survive below that. So from mean high water above to mean uh, higher high water or the highest observable tide, we'll have a variety of high marsh plants ending with um, the pecti uh, Spartina pectinata and uh, Panicum virgatum. Uh, so the, pretty much our whole system falls within there. Every site's gonna have slightly different tides because the way the tide progresses, this is a particularly tricky site because it's at a tidal nodal point in the, in, in the Great Bay Estuary. So we kind of expected higher high tides at this site and we didn't, we didn't get, we didn't get the, the normal spring tides didn't cover as much as we thought they would from our tidal measurements. So uh, the resources that I was mentioned, uh, uh, the project is working on a plant uh, list for New Hampshire to be used in restoration sites. So that should be coming soon. And uh, there's a couple other questions here, Dave, regarding some of the grasses that are uh, 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 relative to what we've just been talking about. And um, one is maybe you could speak to uh, source of grasses. And then there was also a question about uh, mowing uh, some of the salt marsh grasses and the effect that that has, and if you could speak to those two aspects. I don't know that much about mowing. I, I don't, uh, if you mow at the end of September, it's probably not gonna be too deleterious to the grasses, but I really don't know about any benefits, any benefits from mowing. Um, and what was the other question? About sources of plants. Oh, the sources of plants, um, well, the Pearson Nurseries grew, grew the plants out, P-I-E-R-S-O-N. I noticed it was the automatic speller didn't get it quite right in the uh, video. Uh, they're in uh, Southern Maine and they handle a lot of native species. So they're re a really good source. Uh, another source we use is uh, New England wetland plants in uh, Western Massachusetts. And if you're a little to the South of us, you might wanna go to um, some plant suppliers in Maryland or New Jersey. Uh, I think Pinelands Nurseries in New Jersey does a pretty good job on plants. Okay, very good. Uh, so we have lots of questions coming in here. Yeah, they, are, they, they are typically um, wholesale and not retail, unfortunately. So a lot of normal people can't get access to these, to these uh, plants. Normal people being uh, people who were involved with uh, doing living shoreline restorations. No, that's they <laughs> can buy them wholesale, but uh, yeah. a private homeowner is going to have trouble buying 100 Spartina plants. Yeah, maybe there's a niche there for somebody. Uh, did Pearson provide the disticulus? No, we got those from New England wetland plants. Okay, good. Um, so um, I'm trying to catch up and read some of these here. Um, we have LIDAR data uh, for a lot of the marshes or the, all the marshes in Great Bay. And uh, by overlapping that on high resolution tidal wetland habitat data that was recently created, we can get an elevation range for different marsh species. So here's a helpful comment about uh, there are resources available. There is LIDAR da data available that will help people determine uh, which uh, which plant can be uh, planted in, in uh, the different zones that will help with the design of... Uh, of course, the easiest thing, Steve, is to go to your reference marsh, which is uh -huh. you know, next to the marsh you're working on. So if you're lucky enough to have a good reference marsh, that could be very helpful. Yes. You know, one of the questions that was a lot earlier asked about how did we get the, uh, the data for the, um, for the wave energy heights. I thought Tom should uh, answer that was... What, it was a question just at the end of the last section. So I thought we yes. should wrap that one up. Okay. Uh, sure. So um, um, we put out different types of transducers. Uh, one was set at a um, recording interval of one minute and we could leave it out there for two weeks or uh, on order of two weeks. And that's what we use to get the tidal elevation. So again, as Dave indicated, the mean tide, the mean high tide and the mean high high water are three important elevations that distinguish different habitat uh, plant zones. And then for the waves created by boats or wind, those are much uh, uh, smaller frequencies. And so we used a, a different type of transducer that we could monitor, uh, uh, that is pick up water level data at uh, uh, I 
think it was uh, 10 hertz, so 10 times per second. And then from that, uh, you take that data and you tease out of it the wave heights and the wave length and the wave periods. And uh, for wave energy, wave energy is related to uh, the wave period times the wave height um, squared. And um, you develop an energy diagram or an energy spectra as it's known. So you could see where the dominant wave energy was coming from. And at this site, we could see dominant wave energy peaks at um, where there were boats and where there were uh, basically somewhere between capillary waves and uh, just very small uh, gravity waves from the wind. Uh, even though there is a decent fetch, it's not an enormous fetch uh, given where the dominant wind direction is. And then we also saw the seiche, which is the sloshing back and forth of the Great Bay. And uh, we actually saw some uh, larger cycle wave energy. Um, so again, based on all of that information, that's how we use that information to size the sill rock. Okay. There was a couple interesting questions here about, um, you know, newly established marshes are slow to develop underground. Uh, did you attempt to compensate for sea level rise uh, by overplanting or slightly higher elevation in terms of planting? That's a really interesting question about the complexity. Absolutely. Our lower edge of the low marsh was about 1.7 feet higher than the current low marsh. So we um, adjusted for 2016 guess of the sea level rise rising about 1.7 feet. And uh, we were able to uh, ramp up. You can see that tidal buffer area is fairly bare. And so that's going to be transitioning over the next decade uh, to salt marsh. And so that was on purpose. And we did overplant. I mean, the client wanted overplanting. And so even though a lot of those plants died, we brought in plants and we planted. We ended up, so this is important for people. And it's a good take home message. We ended up with about two per square foot of live plants. Uh, we started with about four per square foot. And we ended up with about two because we had a lot of plant death and we replaced a lot of them. So it ended up about like that. Very good. Uh, there's a question here about maintenance at the site. And from, I think this means uh, from here on out, a long-term plan, maybe invasive species removal, those types of things. Yeah, we had a local garden club help us with spe uh, invasive species removal because there were invasive species at the site um, before we started any work. And we wanted to save some plants, but there were invasive species associated with the plants we wanted to save. And so we've been working at that and uh, that's worked out fairly well. There's not too many left. Um, in terms of maintenance, it's not too difficult. The, the, the town didn't want to mow anything. And so they put a lot of mulch down, which we weren't particularly happy with. But um, because they didn't want to mow anything, I think that's, that's, uh, that, that was a good thing in terms of the, the, the question. So we didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I might add for uh, maintenance, um, we are seeing uh, that the core fabric that we use between the marsh sill and the placed material isn't doing the best job at necessarily preserving material washing out at the very top of the sill. And so uh, what we've been doing is uh, creating burritos of um, rack, some of the dead vegetation that's collecting. This site seems to be a magnet for rack. Um, in the zone where the patens is growing. Um, and uh, that we kind of stuff be at the leading edge between the sill and the marsh. Uh, but again, I think in the future, I, I probably might put a core log at the leading edge between any sill and the marsh surface. And, I, and again, another interesting aspect of those core logs that are run parallel to the shoreline is not only can you walk along them for access, and we do see the marsh grasses colonizing it, but also they're a great place where you, if you wanna change slope or make a, a physical elevation change of a few tenths of a foot, you can have that on either side of the core log. And then thirdly, if you do have run on of stormwater from upland areas onto the marsh, that core log will arrest and cease or halt any gullying. So I probably would include more core logs uh, in, in designs in the future. 
Okay. Um, there, I think we've got uh, most of the questions pertinent to the design. We have a minute or two here. If there's uh, any other questions, a question came in about what types of plants were you trying to save? I think this gets to just uh, uh, overall goals of the project. Yeah, um, Shadbush, Amelia Anchor uh, was at the site. We added a whole bunch more more of those. I think they're really pretty in the spring. So I like I kind of prefer those. And but but also things like sweet pepper bush, uh, the high bush blueberries. We didn't plant any high bush blueberries, but we did move them out of harm's way. And there was some sort of a dwarf pine that, that the town had planted, and and they wanted it, so that it was moved out of the way. So that answers. That gets to that question. There's another question on, on Spartina patents and pillows. So there's these organic pillows you can put your patents in and that might um, prevent desiccation. And that's something we probably should try in the future at this site, at least at a couple locations. So thank you for Matt for that, that, that point. And I also wanted to uh, reiterate Rachel's point, Rachel Stevens, who's been working uh, uh, a lot on marsh plans for the, uh, for the estuary. And the information that they produce with marsh plant elevations might be, uh, might be a, a great useful product for everyone trying to do living shorelines that doesn't have a, re a reference marsh nearby. There was a question earlier, we, and we'll have to be kind of quick about it uh, to get to our next section, but can you talk a little bit about uh, historically time periods with marsh loss and uh, movement in Great Bay has, has, has it, always been gradual or have there been periods with uh, sped up marsh change in the system? And I know it's a big question. It is a big question. It's difficult to answer because I'm a little uncertain of the scale of change. So in the scale of, human, of our lifetimes, I think we're looking at a lot of erosion at Wagon Hill Farm just because of, um, there's used to be maybe a hundred people a week going there. And now there's uh, a few thousand people every single day taking their dogs and families down there. And it's a great resource, but it was really overused. And I think that caused, it was related to a lot of the erosion and the increasing erosion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dave. I think uh, you have a few slides to share at this point. I do. I just wanted to sh uh, share some slides about, uh, that showed uh, some of the results that weren't in the video. So for some reason, I'm not getting it on my screen. It's showing up on ours. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. Uh, I just that, have to, Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's better. <laughs> it's just a couple. It's um, one's a before and after picture. Uh-huh. And um, you can kind of see the difference. So that's the eroded shoreline. You can see those large trees that they're actually being undermined. One of those trees, Seth Wilkinson, who's uh, a living shoreline designer on the Cape, stuck a ruler and his arm. So it's like a three foot ruler, a meter stick, and then his arm went under the tree. So they were really gonna fall in. Uh, they showed a little tilt anyway. And that marsh historically went out to pretty almost right to where that tide, the tide line is at that moment the photograph was taken. And then the one on the right is the after, right at the, uh, the buffer. So this is showing right at that tree line, pretty much right at that tree line where those trees were about to fall in. Mm -hmm. And that's an area that can migrate in the future. This is a drones shot of the site uh, showing the fencing, the fencing that goes out into the water that tries to people, keep people off of the marsh. Um, you can see in this little section, this is uh, where the old peat was. So this is some of the the uh, shorter grasses and the plantings and the high marsh plantings and then this buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And this is the design that uh, was agreed upon by everyone where um, we have the existing, you can see the existing ground and uh, we had uh, the, the cut where these trees were sitting originally and those were, that sediment was uh, cut off and sprinkled into the, the lower area we have a coral log in the middle and um, distinguishing high marsh from low marsh and protecting the low marsh edge. We have a, a very narrow sill here 
the sill became wider because of some concerns of so much fill, perhaps just uh, liquid, maybe, uh, well, I'll, I'll let Tom explain it, just pressing on those rocks and causing so the rocks to be dislodged at the lower edge of the sill. Yeah, basically uh, that sill is uh, bulky enough that it can't be pushed over by a liquefied uh, mass behind it. And, and to be clear, um, uh, we studied a lot of marshes uh, around the Great Bay system to understand what that fill material should be. It's uh, a sandy particle size distribution. And uh, amazingly, uh, we went out to a number of gravel pits. No one really has it. You would have to mix two or three different materials together to get the mix uh, that's desired. But uh, amazingly, uh, Durham had material that they uh, dig out of the roadside swales when they're cleaning them out in the spring. And that material was pretty close to what we needed. So basically what we did was build uh, the bottom elevation with that material. And then at the top, we used a, a, a mix of two different gravel pit materials uh, uh, that matched the particle system distribution system we wanted. It's a sandy material. The uh, Spartina roots can grow fairly easily into it. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, that was a very good discussion. Lots of great questions came in. Um, we have uh, 15 minutes left on um, this webinar and uh, or uh, online field trip. Um, I just want to quickly uh, remind people um, at 11 o'clock when we're officially ending, um, everyone's agreed, uh, re researchers have agreed to stay on for 15 minutes afterwards if there's some questions and I know that I missed a few. So if you're able to stay on from 11 to 11.15, please do so. Have uh, another few minutes of opportunity to talk with the researchers and get your uh, questions answered. And at this time, I wanna turn it over to Kirsten who's gonna talk about the opportunity that's coming up. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks, everybody. That was a great discussion and um, really fun to be part of. Um, I'm going to, before I talk about this new project that we have, I'm going to share one link in the chat and we'll send this around after as well. But uh, it's the Coastal Adaptation Workgroup landing page for this Wagon Hill Farm Living Shoreline project, where you can find the link to the video. You can also find the permits and the designs and other resources that might be helpful to take a look at. Um, so while you're thinking about the project, I'll, I'll share that link so that you can, um, you can share that or, or take another deeper dive. So, um, so I'll introduce myself first. I'm Kirsten Howard. I'm the Resilience Program Coordinator with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program. And uh, we are excited, this team and others are, are part of a larger project that was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, National Coastal Resilience Fund. We're calling it the Great Bay Living Shoreline Project. It's sort of a follow on to our work at Wagon Hill Farm. And um, we are, uh, the project is aiming to create three to four new living shoreline projects in the Great Bay Estuary focused on erosional sites that will protect salt marsh habitat and coastal communities from erosion, sea level rise, and flooding where that's relevant. And as part of this project, we're launching a new professional development program that will support professionals looking to gain hands-on experience with living shoreline designs. So uh, we're soliciting applications from landscapers, landscape designers, engineers, restoration professionals, project managers, and contractor professionals that are based in New England to form living shoreline design teams. And each team is going to be assigned uh, to one of the three to four sites along Great Bay and will work with UNH and the other project team partners as well as the property owner to develop a living shoreline conceptual designs for each site, which will then be presented in a larger event. So the call for applications is being released today. And uh, this is the first announcement we're making about it. Um, we have a project website. I'll place that link in the chat as well, where you can access more information about the uh, project and about the, this opportunity and uh, the application form itself. It's a pretty simple application form. 
And uh, we do have stipend funding available for folks um, if, they, if they need it. And we have uh, a few other um, uh, exciting plans for curriculum as part of the project as well. So I'm happy to take a couple questions um, now about the opportunity if folks have them. I'll, let me just share the project website link in the chat here. And um, I think that's, that's sort of the gist of it. Um, and so if anyone has questions or um, follow on, wants to do a little follow on discussion about that, uh, we can do that for a couple of minutes. Okay, very good. Um, and while people are uh, typing in any questions they have, I'll just remind folks that uh, after this event, uh, we will uh, send everybody uh, links to the three videos that we showed during this uh, during this event. They're online at, on a YouTube site and uh, you can use those for educational purposes for other uh, members of your boards or committees or groups that may be uh, interested in uh, living shoreline restoration. They can be really helpful. We're also going to be uh, uh, finishing up a plant list for New Hampshire pretty soon and we'll be sending that out in the near future. Um, and also there are some great resources, educational resources. Uh, this project was part of a larger New England wide project about the state of uh, living shorelines in New England and status of them. And uh, there's that and other resources that have been done that we will relink to you all uh, in the near future. So uh, I'm looking for some questions. Uh, I don't see any coming in specifically about the opportunity. Uh, but we will be sending, uh, definitely hit those links. It's a, it's a great opportunity to participate in a design team uh, uh, for uh, designing a living shoreline and uh, uh, check those links out for the materials and information there about the opportunity that's coming up. Um, maybe we should just go to the closing poll and I'll monitor for questions. If you have any questions about the opportunity, please type them in. In the meantime, we can do a little closing poll, a little evaluation that will help us in the future. So if everybody could just take a minute to do that, be very helpful for us. Good, starting to get some responses coming in. While you're working on that and uh, doing the closing poll, I just wanna thank everybody for attending today and spending the time with us this morning. Um, look for those follow-ups uh, from Kirsten and myself and others with the materials and the resources. Um, um, and if you wanna be added to the uh, Living Shorelines Professional Network contact list, uh, just respond to that email from Kirsten and mention to her if you're not already on that list that you'd like to be added to that and she'll get you on that list and we can keep you informed about future events and uh, future workshops and uh, informational, um, informational events that way. Appreciate uh, people taking the poll giving us some feedback, which is very helpful. Uh, if you've completed the poll and if you have any questions, again, uh, feel free to type those into the chat and they can be questions about the opportunity and or about uh, any of the videos or information about the living shoreline. Um, there were some great comments in here about some of the challenges last year, establishing new marshes because of the drought, uh, especially in the high marsh and I know that uh, at this site, uh, there were some people that, that did water those plants a couple times and the comment includes uh, a couple of watering events can make a big difference in the survival of the plants. Uh, so, and I think that's been the experience at this site and others uh, here in New Hampshire. And I think Dave referred to that a little bit and talked about trying to get the planting done in May earlier before it really gets hot and dry. Uh, and that helps with the uh, plant survivorship. Okay, we've got a lot of good, uh, most people have taken the poll. Just a reminder, we'll have a few extra minutes here if you're able to hang on and have questions that we did not get to. Um, so once you've completed the poll, feel free to um, raise your hand and uh, we'll pull you off of mute or you can unmute yourself to ask a question uh, of Dave or Tom or Kirsten. 
or type it into the chat there or get a cup of coffee. I think the uh, good discussions, good questions came in today throughout. Okay, here's polling results. I'm looking for any raised hands or questions if anyone has any and or comments. Oh, here's a question came in. To what extent does dredging of the Piscataqua for navigation cause an increase in loss of sediment and in any way to prevent or slow that rate of loss? So question about the uh, dredging yeah. that goes on. I'll, I'll try to speak to that. I, I was on a blue ribbon panel for uh, examination of the loss of salt marshes in Jamaica Bay. And from that moment on, I realized that uh, dredging can be a, a huge sink for really fine grain materials. And that has to influence the net amount of sediment available for marsh growth. So I think the more dredging that occurs in a system, the less sediments are gonna be available. Not because of the sediments taken out, is because a giant hole was made and all this, all the fine grain sediments are gonna be going into that hole preferentially then uh, spread out all over the system the way it normally would be if the hole wasn't there. I, and I might add to that, um, the dredge hole is an area that would basically rob the marshes of sediment. But the other aspect of that is by making a portion of this aquatic system deeper you don't get as much dissipation of the wave energy. So you're just aggravating the hydraulic attack on the marshes themselves. Okay. I think there were some questions I missed earlier. Uh, there was a question, interesting question about have, have, have you seen uh, changes in the salinity in the system uh, over time? And I think it kind of gets to climate change, sea level rise, and also just changing conditions. But uh, specifically, uh, how that might relate to uh, restoration or shellfish beds. Yeah, I'm not sure about the shellfish beds. I, I have not seen a change in salinity at this site. Uh, in the video, the last video, you might have noticed there were cattails growing at the edge of where I was walking. And those cattails are a really good indicator of runoff. And um, not only runoff, but seepage of fresh water from the uplands into the system. Um, and so the cattails were there before we started work on the system and uh, they're doing okay now. I don't expect it to become a lot fresher. Um, and uh, because there's so much tide in Great Bay, it's just that the tidal currents in Great Bay are gonna bring, bring that salt water in no matter what. David, is there any relationship between uh, erosion rates and salinity or Dave and Tom? I don't know of any. Okay, I, have a I have a question for, for you all. Um, were there any unintended consequences of the project? And if so, what mm -hmm. were those? Um, I can name one. And that is by protecting this area of marsh from foot traffic, it just moved it to other marshes, which is unfortunate, but it just mm. demonstrates that the public, at least in this area, wants access to the water somehow, whether that be over the marsh or at locations, maybe just to look at it. So one aspect of what we designed here was a, a kind of a lookout pier so that people could actually uh, walk closer to the water in a very restricted area that's fenced off and also be able to look over the marsh. Uh, we have game cameras up at the site and we've demonstrated that, yeah, there's no, not as many people and, and dogs getting onto the marsh we restored and that there are many, many people using this pier that was built for observation just to take pictures or just to get better views. So um, that's probably the biggest consequence I can think of. Yeah, and I, I think that's really an important one because I uh, uh, just yesterday was at uh, along the, the river in uh, Portsmouth and um, the marsh, uh, there were several places in the marsh where you could see, you know, 
literally hundreds of footprints through it to get access to the water. And I, I, I think any design really needs to, or and location uh, specific designs, um, you really do human nature, you're just gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna get down to the water and put your finger in it. And then I think that has to be something to really be seriously considered on designs. All right, dope. I got some new messages down, roll down. Just some comments about thanks for sharing. Uh, what are your feelings on using soil choking riprap in areas of higher erosion areas? I'm not sure what a, do you guys understand that? The feelings on using soil choking riprap in areas of higher erosion. Um, so, so in general, um, if you're using riprap, uh, it probably is not going to succeed just by itself. And the reason for that is um, the native material behind the riprap where the salt marsh is, is sand size or smaller. And you need to have something between those two sizes to prevent that finer material from washing out through the interstices of the riprap. If you just put riprap right on, on the, the vertical face, that may slow down the erosion, but it's not gonna stop it. Um, so that in and of itself is only a temporary measure. And then ultimately, again, the riprap isn't necessarily habitat. What would happen is the fines would wash out behind it and then the riprap would basically settle down into the mud flat and be covered. So uh, that's kind of a temporary measure. Um, probably if you had put down uh, some type of uh, we use the core, but typically in engineering terms, you'd use a geotextile, something that would prevent the movement of the material through the riprap. That would give you more life. But again, um, you just can't put riprap out there. This needs to be permitted. This is, these are all wetland areas. Tom, can you speak to, uh, could you use core mats or what other, uh, what other design features could you use in combination. So we, we've uh, discussed and thought about core mats and we actually put some core logs out there. Uh, they don't really survive the winter that well. The ice really destroys them. And so they may have a life of anywhere from three to five years. And then they're either gonna be shredded beyond um, recognition or they could even raft out if they're not anchored down properly. And the real issue and, and an important take home message is nothing with significant roots will grow below the mean tide. If we could engineer mangroves up here, that would be great, but we don't have something like that with roots that will hold sediment. And so that vertical face um, is really tough to protect up here. Very good. Um, do you do do you as a team have any questions for the participants? I guess uh, one what I I would throw out there is uh, given the the breadth and depth of the people who have participated, um, maybe why they're not seeing more living shoreline implementation. Ah yes, I like that. Uh, anyone? willing to speak to that a little bit about why we're not seeing more implementation of living shorelines uh, in the system, addressing erosion issues. I mean, I think we could all kind of guess, but it'd be nice if uh, someone had some specific real life examples of the issues that they're dealing with uh, that's preventing more living shoreline work from happening. Uh, response in the chat just about not enough knowledge. Speaking to, I think, just again, uh, uh, educational awareness issues uh, specific to living shorelines. And another comment here, I've seen a lot of people just uh, copy their neighbors, so it's hard to convince them to do, do other things. And I think that gets to, you know, if your neighbor puts in a, a wall, then that tends to spread and um, again, having good examples around. 
cost barriers due to design permitting requirements. Of course, we kind of hinted at that a little bit earlier and talked to, spoke to that a little bit about the number of meetings and permitting. And um, I think early on in this project, there was a real effort made to have some good dialogue with all the permitters. And it was very complex with each permitter with the, their area of purview. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. And I think we're seeing uh, with education and good demonstration projects like that and just good collaborative effort being made with all the stakeholders, including all of the permitters to understand the issues. I think that's an improving situation. Uh, also previously mentioned hard structures have immediate results. Yeah, you feel like you've uh, solved the problem. Uh, where softer approaches take time to develop and require maintenance. Good point. Uh, comment here about uh, what I see a lot of time is uh, uh, it's cheaper to put in riprap by developments and uh, spreading seed mixes instead of actual restoration. Hmm. Lots of comments coming in here. Would anybody like to speak to them? I feel like I'm... I think Robert hit, hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's It really is going to take a paradigm shift and the permitting groups in New Hampshire have pushed that ahead by because it this work coincided with the, they're rewriting a lot of the rules. So we have maybe a leg up in New Hampshire and Massachusetts is it's going to be a challenge. Um, and I don't think the state agencies want to rewrite do any rewriting of the of the wetlands rules right now for just because of my involvement in another project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, things here in New Hampshire are really moving forward. I think that's thanks to all the partners involved, the university coastal program and DES and uh, other agencies. Uh, it's been a real nice sustained effort for, uh, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years really trying to focus on living shorelines and make them a priority. So I think that speaks to the the network we have here and, uh, and uh, uh, the ability to, to influence change with uh, regulations and stakeholders. All right. Other comments coming in here. There's some monitoring uh, suggest uh, thoughts in New York from Hannah Wiley that they're doing monitoring to see how, how well they work. And I just wanted to re uh, it just reminded me to speak to the fact that this is a aquatic resource mitigation project. So we use some of their monies. They help support this de development. And that's a state New Hampshire DES program to use mitigation monies of habitats or wetlands lost from other projects. It's sort of an in lieu fee response. And, um, and so we're able to monitor this for five years. And so that's that, that will be good and we'll put, put together a final report uh, to get some of the long-term perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yes. All uh, right. Somebody asked about uh, seed and actually seeding salt marshes. I think that's, if it's, um, if it's really large, if it's more than, uh, an acre or so of marsh, I think seeding is, is, can be done effectively. But if it's smaller than that, you probably don't have the seed sources or the seeds you put may be just subject to wave energy and, and loss. Mm -hmm. So seeding is a, is, a, is a challenge. And we, after the professionals left the site and the alternate floor was probably about 40% live. And we used, we worked with, community to have a community planting event. And so I know it's, that's hard to do on private land, but on public land, if you organize a community planting event, uh, you can do the work with just the price of the, price of the plugs and the, um, and the people overseeing the work. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of great comments came in about uh, what people are seeing and uh, preventing more living shorelines being done. We 
Very good. Uh, we still have a few minutes here. Uh, Tom and Dave, any uh, last comments that you want to add? Putting you on the spot. I think one of the one of our take home messages we might not have shared is that we'd probably make that sill a, a, a couple inches higher than we made it uh, just to protect, to stop the erosion right behind the sill from the waves coming in over the sill and moving the sediment around before the plants can get established. So I think that was a, an important point. Yeah, and just to clarify, that sill would sit higher than the marsh right next to it. So it kind of acts as a, a windbreaker or a wave breaker in this case, but actually from runoff coming from shoreward as well as the waves and the water coming uh, seaward. So a question here was, uh, how was the sill elevation established? Um, we had survey control. So we uh, had XYZ coordinates at known benchmarks. And then during construction, uh, there was a laser level out there that made sure we were within a tenth of a foot for everything. And then of course, as you would expect, um, we tried to build everything a little high because we expected that the mud that we were building over would settle a little bit. And, and in fact, we saw that about on the order of about a tenth of a foot. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'll just mention to everybody, uh, uh, the, of course, if you're not familiar with the Wagon Hill site, it's open to the public um, all the time. And David mentioned just again, the number of people that use the site. It's a great a uh, great resource that uh, is provided, uh, but uh, definitely feel free to visit the site yourself. There's the kiosk there and uh, you can get a really great sense of the site. Uh, the videos that we watched today were recorded last year um, and you can again, always watch those. We'll send you the link to them. It might be interesting to see if you can see some differences from last year's growth to this year growth and some of the conditions out there in terms of plants uh, taking hold and those types of things. So lots of thanks coming in from uh, participants, which is very nice. Uh, thank you all for spending the time with us. We do have a few more minutes if anyone has a last question for our uh, scientific team and or resource managers. All right. Thanks. Well, Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Kirsten. Again, thanks to all the participants for uh, uh, sharing with us and look for some uh, communications from us in the near future with resources and links to those videos, as well as the opportunity to join one of these design teams. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.